Okay, so without further ado, our first reader is going to be Anna Maria Caballero, and after her, the next one will be Catherine Reinhardt. And welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, my piece is called Parentage. Anna, mother of Maria. Maria, mother of Jesus. Jesus, son of Maria. Maria, daughter of Anna. Anna, grandmother of Jesus. Jesus, grandson of Anna. Parentage is linear and circular and perpendicular, always intersecting related physical bodies at once. Anna and Maria, through time, merged into commonly given name, my name. As name, grandmother and mother conjoin into singular, oracular, vernacular form, free of son. Oh, the omniscient, eternally suffering son. Ana Maria, not Ave Maria. In Spanish, grandmother does not translate into gran madre. No grand cognate idiom of mother, but a construct all its own, exact, abuela. My abuelas are Estela and Lucia. Lucia, Lula, died at age 102 and ran a dairy farm on the outskirts of Bogota until shortly before she passed. Estela, Estelita, whose name traced to source means star, still drives and lies about her age. Because of my parentage, I am led to believe I may never die. I go by Anna, which means I twist my neck when this word is said, Anna. Anna, built of two A's, one N, Latin Anna. Nothing eternally suffering about the uttering of this name. The compound name, Anna Maria, too much toil in my mouth, your mouth, too beholden to mother, my mother, to lineage. You see, my mother's name is Ana Maria too, specifically Ana Maria de la Auxiliadora. The name Estela, Estelita, promised the Virgin Mary to give her fourth child if it was born a girl after she pushed out three live boys. Ave Maria, the Virgin delivered. Auxilio means help. The exclamation necessary to translation. Help me, Virgin, Virgencita, send me a girl. If you do, I will name her like you, Maria Auxiliadora. I go, sit, stand as Anna, so slight no one suffers when it is uttered, so self-contained it shrugs all familial weight. Neutral yet familiar, secular in its generational faith. My daughter shoulders her own name, no need to break to be free. I am her mother, sure, an axle of story, but not the atlas, not her cardinal system of way. Nina, I named her, Nina Isadora. Go on with my muzzle, I nudge her. Go on and be great. Thank you. Hello, my name is Catherine Reinhardt. I'm an interdisciplinary artist who makes fiber art and conducts socially engaged projects with abandoned textiles. These works center on themes of domestic labor, connection, and care. As artist and mother, I am both archivist and field hand, creating studies in the accretion of domestic life and cataloging its labors. My vision is one of radical hospitality and a generous art practice, which redeems the overlooked domestic landscape, cares for forgotten textiles, and honors the undervalued labors of motherhood. Through site-specific installations and interactive works, 
I create spaces where these themes manifest through fostered connection and engagement among audiences. What is depletion, burnout, being on the brink, untenable time, fatigue threshold, journal entry, July, 2019. I am constantly killing our grass. I will come out after a day or two of being trapped inside due to the sickness of a child or the state of my laundry to see piles of rotting leaves or an abandoned toy left out to make a sickly yellow impression. I kill our, our grass through neglect, leaving my son's dirty t-shirt out, unable emotionally to pick up one more pile of stinking and wilted foliage, which I myself pulled victoriously from be between the hostas. Neglect of duty, indicator of thoughtlessness, evidence of activity. Little did I know what 2020 would hold. My contribution to volume 19 of Mom Egg Review is a visual artwork called Take Care Exhausted. This work is a composite image of a textile installation made from an old corduroy quilt and hand stitched with the text Take Care. This work was left out in the blazing heat from May to July of 2020. Originally an extension of greeting to my neighbors and in fact to the world. During this brutal pandemic, this work became instead an omen, a warning, and a call to arms. Take care, lest you become depleted. Take care to see who you welcome, snub, or embrace. Take care of all the things and don't neglect yourself. Take care to do this while being brave, self-sufficient, and loosed from your normal networks of support. As this fiber work faded in the sun, it reflected the exhausting experience of mothering during a global pandemic. I am interested in the point at which motherhood becomes untenable, exploring through visual art the limitations of maternal labor, the traces of domestic activity, and the indicators of a much too busy life. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm coming to you from sunny Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm really excited to be published in Mom Egg Review for the first time with so many poets I admire. In early 2020, right at the start of the pandemic, my first full length book, What is in the Blood came out. It's partly about growing up in rural Pennsylvania when my mother was diagnosed with bipolar disorder then called manic depression. Our house was surrounded by farms and cornfields, and in the summer, the flies came and stayed. This is a poem written last April. It draws some words and inspiration from the wonderful singer-songwriter who we lost, John Prine, as well as the poets John Clare and Issa. One other note, Putting a penny in a bag of water is an old wives' tale said to repel flies and mosquitoes. This is house flies. Maybe the flies come when she sleeps, window dwellers wringing their hands, little holy ones in the kitchen, buzzing in the key of F. What could they believe, praying or singing in the days of her metamorphosis, looking for a warm place for winter. It's probably too late now, like putting a penny in a bag of water. What will gather, what will seep on the table, on the porch screen? In the springtime, meat or molasses, fruit or some sugar, they had to choose what to serve for dinner, what to use to bait the trap. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for organizing this lovely event. I'm very grateful to be here. My poem is called Her Possessions. When she is dead, the rooms will echo with the emptiness of Bennington, China and of Staffordshire. The heavy gold bracelets and hobnail milk glass. 
the ruby pins and the turquoise. As antique wicker chairs hang in the big white barn, the black elm grove decays. The apple orchard rots next to a crumbling spring house. I don't want the pewter or the oak carved clocks, not anything she's touched or anything she hasn't touched. Her white hair caught in the sofa cushions, her rusty promises clogging the faucets. Everything in that house was chipped or broken, surviving beyond its cracked beauty. The ditches of the farm road covered by weeds. Even the quilts pieced by hand, stitched with repeated motifs. You can burn them in a bonfire or place them in a stranger's hands. Hourglass, hole in the barn door, all tangled up, dog tooth violet, crown of thorns. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the editors and all the great poets that are here. I'm very happy to be part of this. Uh, my poem is on page 55 of the journal in case anyone's following along. Um, and it's called Mother Comes Back as a Bee. When I heard my name as a buzz in my ear, I knew she had come back as a bee. One I hoped without its stinger. My mother floated among my garden tomatoes, then rested inside an eggplant blossom. Why a bee, I asked. I didn't get to choose, she said. Can you make honey? I'm not that kind of bee. Why not come inside, Mom, where there's air conditioning to talk? I just wanted to take a look at you, she replied, circling me twice before she flew away. Beautiful. Hi, I'm Kyle Potvin. Thank you so much, Marjorie, Jen, and Cindy for putting this beautiful issue together. 18 birthday candles. Think of blowing. Think of breath, your breath, not mine. Humid air, gusting with error. Think of lungs full, lips pursed. Think of what you want this year. Wish for that. Wish for smoke to carry your prayers. Once you told me candles were lit for the goddess of hunting. Candles were lit to glow like the moon. Blow and an incandescent glow remained. That was yesterday. Today, dear strong sun, lick your fingers, extinguish each flame with your bare hand. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you to Jen and to Cindy. And um, thanks to all the poets and other people watching here today. Um, my poem is page 43 in the issue, if anyone wants to follow along. Um, this is from a series of prose poems I wrote um, in the years after my mother's um, passing, uh, ba based on dreams that I was having about her. Hooded. At the top step above the family room, my mother appears, floating in midair, as if seated on an invisible chair. What she's telling me is important, but her head is covered by a dark cloth, her face hidden. Please take that off, it's distracting. No, she doesn't have permission. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Michelle Sharp. I'm a poet and essayist and book reviewer. <coughs> Excuse me. 
My poem's title is Leaving. For those of us abandoned, it is the story of not finding you. Like orphan swans, we imprint on ducklings, strangers, and romantic stories, studying how crying started and how it ends. Our own exits start out hesitant until we learn leaving is the foolproof way to end all fighting the peer-reviewed solution to any naked moment, affordable insurance against the fallout of not minding pain. So many ways to leave. I'm not ready for commitment, a slammed door, a squeal of tires, or constant lying. Who hasn't assembled a fetish to abandonment? Mine's a girlish cake with spikes dressed up in sugar icing, mama. She'll melt away on any tongue she's lent. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful work, both of you. Um, our next two readers are Natalie Gerrich Brabson and Rachel Inciarte. Hi, I'm Natalie Garrick Brabson. Marjorie and Cindy and Jennifer, thank you so much for hosting this and thank you for putting together the beautiful issue. So my piece is called Need Me and it's a flash fiction story. Charlie's call wakes me from my nap. She's at the movies with Gio and I silence the phone even though I suspect, suspect something must be wrong for her to call mid movie. The anxiety of the first 13 years of raising her has finally begun to dissipate. I just want to sleep a little longer. Then, before the call disappears from my screen, I sit up, swipe, and answer. Mom, she says, we broke up. Their relationship has lasted too long for my comfort, particularly as they approach high school, where they'll observe and then emulate older kids, but they're sweet together. I search for the right words, something that won't make her open up, exposed at the theater. Typical for your age. I need you to pick us up, she says. I want to tell her to finish Marbled Sky 3D. The tickets were expensive, really more than I could afford. She'd been begging to see this movie since the preview started showing last winter. We were going to go together, she and I, but I don't tell her any of that. When she hangs up, I grab her denim jacket she insisted on wearing a sundress to the theater, and I know they keep it cold. I stuff all the bills I can find into my pocket. We will go out for ice cream after we drop Gio off. Months ago, I decided this, knowing that she will lean on me this time, that with each subsequent breakup as she grows up, she will need me less. Driving, I imagine that I've already arrived at the theater, that Charlie spots me, that she races ahead of Gio and climbs into the car, that she reaches for my embrace. At a stoplight, I text her. Anderson's or Hannah's frosty treats. She does not respond. The kids are outside when I pull up at the theater. They're standing upright and rigid and close, nearly touching. A week ago, they stood the same way to hold hands. Charlie fiddles with a passenger door handle, but ultimately slides in the back seat next to Gio. I pass her jacket to her. She shrugs it over her shoulders without putting her arms through. I mouth to her ice cream later. She will not meet my eyes. Hello, Mrs. Camille, Gio greets me. He is, as always, excruciatingly, absurdly polite. Just Camille. I pull him out of the lot and remind him again. I'm not a missus. I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I wrote a nonfiction, but I'm going to read poetry. So thank you for allowing me. <laughs> this piece is called Cages and Supports. When the children are tucked in bed, I root through seed catalogs, delivered home each fresh season. Read over the text the way some people study poetry or prayer. The promise of creamy blooms sustains me. I fantasize spicy greens. Hidden toward the back of one, I find a page, pages and supports, eyes sticking like the fat rabbit caught on a gooseberry net, 
thinking of the story my daughter squirmed through at bedtime. Here are photographs of bound blossoms beside claims, holds stems tight to the stake and secure to support growth. Melon cradles carry fruit at an arm's length. A galvanized fence, corral to keep your vines from growing, wild. I am mortified, preferring my own sun-kissed sprouts. God made dirt and dirt won't hurt. Wind blown and tangled, the occasional bruise, all makes them that much sweeter. They are asleep now in the nursery, those feral delights. Hi, Marjorie, thank you. And thank you other editors and thank you wonderful poets. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, my mom was dying at this time last year and I wrote this poem while that horrible event was happening. It's on page 76. It says, my questions for the hospice nurse. Why can't I feel my bra on my skin? Do I put my bra on first? In my sock? How do I fry an egg? When will she stop swallowing, stop eating? Why are her toenails and fingernails still growing? Did I wipe her? Did I wash myself? Did I brush her teeth? Have I brushed my teeth? Combed my hair? When was the last time I went outside, fed the squirrels, listened to the birds? Why are there keys in my hand? glasses on my face, milk still sitting out on the table. Why did I pee in my pants in the middle of the night? Is her diaper full? Is she here or somewhere in the past? We're swimming in the pool at the Y. I'm spinning around wearing my pink tutu in front of the stove. She's teaching me how to skip behind the market. We're rocking on the chair braiding my hair, falling, falling, covering my shoulders. She's tracing the wall with her fingers. Is she drawing, painting, or teaching? What does she see on that blank white wall? Did I give her the right pills? Did I take my pills? Or did I forget again? When the rabbi with the invisible braces comes to visit, he says, there are no new prayers. Is this her God's will? Her will? Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Marjorie and everyone at Mom Egg Review. And I have loved listening to all these poems. So thank you. Uh, mine is called Ghost. All summer, my father plays evangelical AM in the garden on an old radio to keep out the deer. Neighbors have barbed wire fences, motion sensors, traps, but he uses a radio. The voices, the singing, the brave hallelujah of being born again keeps them away. My friend says for weeks, a single noisy cricket has sung outside her window every night, kept her awake. One morning, she crept out early, poured gasoline on it. Finally, sleep, but no song. Near the end of June, the baby arrives, but he is dead already. We hold the husk of him in a white blanket before the mortician comes. No blood hum or cry song, just silence. August moon and stories around the fire, and in the backyard, my father's radio. We lean in to hear the end of a ghost story, a haunting, a spirit returning home. And from the corn stalks, a woman sings, be still my soul. Crackle of the fire and the spirits we can't see. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. We sang near a tiny grave on a June day. My son is a mystery, a body we held briefly and let go. My body is a mystery, a cave, a house, a shell. The Bible says one day the earth will be fire 
and we'll all be born again to singing or to silence. Come to me then, my little dear, my cricket, my darkest, hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marjorie, and thanks for partnering um, with me on this. The NEA gives these great, wonderful grants to 75 communities around the country to have communities have conversations on one book. And this is Raz's graphic memoir, and it's really special and wonderful. And um, it's wonderful to have that connection. So I, uh, the poem I'm going to share with you now was written in, uh, I think, April last year. And I was a new, a mom new to being a teenage mom, mom to a new teenager of 13. Most of you who have teenagers know that they keep the door closed and you don't know when it's okay to go in. So this is the poem. Home isolation, day 42. I open my son's door. It smells of boy funk, dog and morning breath. When I ask, do you need any help? I mean, tornadoes, fractions, conjugations, but I also mean interrogations of the gentler kind. How are you doing? What do you miss? How can I substitute for your losses? A dirty sock, whirring laptop, abandoned saxophone, caseless, exposed, today, put nothing away. Thank you. Hi, my name's Connie Post. And if it's okay, I wanted to just share, I had my, got my hard copy in the mail a couple of days ago and it's just so beautiful. And I wanted to thank um, all the editors. I feel like Mom Egg Review does this exemplary, um, it really puts a, forth a fine example of what community and poetry really means. And I think it's super important to feel like part of a community. And so I wanted to thank you guys for doing that. Um, the poem I'm gonna read is um, called The Season Begins. And in order to enhance the props or the background, I have noisy grandchildren in the background. So if you hear, to, to enhance the experience, if you hear them screaming or crying, then you know that'll just add to the ambiance. Anyways, uh, this is about my son who I just wanted to mention is 35 and he, about my son and grandson, but he has very profound autism. And after a year plus, he was finally able to come home to our house yesterday, so it was a very emotional event. Anyways, um, my, the poem, The Season Begins. When my grandson's baseball clothes arrive in the mail, we swiftly take them out and make sure they fit just right. We fasten the small elastic belt around his five-year-old waist. The helmet fits perfect. He bonks it for fun. The socks go all the way up to the knee. I am telling myself, stay in the now. I am telling myself not to think of my own son 25 years ago. I was researching autism then in libraries. Google was not yet born. I was buying helmets to prevent self-injury. I was buying socks to replace the ones he chewed holes in. Back then, I drove to all the baseball fields in my town, pulling over, next to the cyclone fences, watching each boy take his turn and swing the bat, watching each ball find its way upwards towards to an, omni an amniotic sky, then succumb to its own peculiar gravity as if we had any say in its descent. Thank you. Hello, can you all hear me okay with this? I'm not used to using this mic, it's noisy at my house. It's so fun to be here and see all the faces that go with the work in the issue. The poem I'm going to read um, was written pre-pandemic, but I think it speaks totally to the moment that we're in now. So I'm so glad that it uh, found a home with um, Mom Egg Review and came out in this time and place that seems right for it. It's called Flowers Moon. Spring, and the boy is walking, wearing his new soft-soled shoes, 
green leather with a black bear stitched onto the toe. Shoes, he said, clear as anything when I sat him in my lap to put them on. He doesn't want to be carried, doesn't want to ride in his stroller. I button his corduroy coat and tie his hat and we go out under the windy sky. He sets his feet down hard, feeling the flagstones, wobbles into a squat beside the crocuses, first flowers of his second year. Months have passed with hardly any color, and now the buds unclasp, six petals making purple stars around six golden anthers. He touches with one finger, ducks his head to whisper a syllable I stoop to hear. Fluff, another word to expand his kingdom. The moon, too, is cause for exclamation. We search the sky until he finds it starting over, slenderest white nick in the blue. There's so much he doesn't know. Why not start with flowers, with the moon's dependable return? Nothing stops the world's desire to go on unfolding. I'm Eva Savatra. Um, so I have to say this is like my first Zoom meeting and so far I am loving it, um, but not new to Zoom because I'm also a teacher and I teach on Google Meet. Um, so just very quickly before I start to read, I kind of want to just go over the fact that, um, you know, I, I often say that kind of motherhood came for me. And that's just like my way of saying that I was completely, totally unprepared. Um, and I was also, I also want to kind of point out the fact that before I read this poem, that it was um, kind of something that I was already writing in my head, sort of, um, during the El Paso shooting that occurred. And it kind of just made me realize that there's so much more to mothering. Um, so this poem is called, My Mother Insists My Son's Complexion Will Lighten. I gave birth into a crumbling world. I wanted a piece of myself unleashed into the world like disease. I once thought anger a form of grief. Now I know it to be a mixture of things deep inside the body. It swirls with every realization. I'll feel it again, but harder. My breath knocked out after each wave. It's the same feeling Mary had when Christ was crucified. She slips away with each thud of the hammer. What have I done? I've provided flesh for this feast. Will you ever forgive me, lamb, for consumption? One of the fantastic things about listening to all of you read is that I will never ever read this book, which I will many times in the future without hearing every one of your voices. All so different, all so moving. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The Weight of Loon. For those of you who may not know, a loon is a kind of bird that lives up here in Canada. The egg finally died. You need to hear that right now to know this is how the story ends so you can bear it. But before that, before the sun baked the loon's egg to death over three weeks and the raccoon crushed the corpse-filled shell, she held a large stone in her bill to show me what she had lost. She'd built her nest on a shoreline raft beside my dock and choppy waves had jostled the egg into the lake. And the water was too deep and the egg was too large and she couldn't roll it back to safety and she was crying, crying. It's six in the morning and I wake with a start, hearing the wails. Something's wrong. I rush outside, race partway down wooden steps to the lake. The loon and her mate are swimming near the nest, diving and bobbing, paddling in frantic circles. She glances up and sees me, dives again, and emerges with a stone in her bill, her eyes riveted on mine. The stone is big as an avocado, smaller than her egg, but large enough to make her point. I enter the shallows and creep toward the nest, uncertain what will happen next. They back away, and I look 
down into the water at the murky bottom and there lies the sparkled egg wedged between two rocks unbroken thank god but probably too cool to hatch now the lake is frigid it's only june but still what can you do i pick it up and oh the majesty of feeling the weight of loon in your hands I show them the egg and softly place it in the nest and wade back to the dock. She rushes at the nest and clambers onto the egg. He keeps his distance, Bill poised, watching me retreat. I'd love to say that the egg hatched and the chick lived and the family thrived, but no. The shoreline faced west and lay beneath skimpy overhanging branches. She spent all the sun-seared afternoons on the nest, unshaded, head down and panting, weakening, and long after the egg failed to hatch on schedule, she would not leave. So you could say the raccoon was a blessing, don't you think? He raided the nest on the 40th night and stole the egg, and she left. She swam away. And it broke my heart to watch her go, but not as much as when I saw her holding that stone in her bill, staring at me, woman to woman, saying, help me, this is what I have lost, please help me find my baby, please help me find. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Marjorie. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm gonna read my essay, The Sign, and I have blocked out uh, parts of it in the interest of time. So here we go, The Sign. I wake at 5.20 a.m., Chong, eyes wide open. Beside me, my husband, Hank, sleeps soundly. Why can't I sleep like him? In an hour or so, our son, Joseph, would be leaving their home in Laurel Canyon with his bride-to-be, Shannon, to drive to the Honda Center in Anaheim for their 8.40 a.m. appointment. In the parking lot, they'll wait until called forward to a numbered booth where they will fill out the paperwork for a public marriage license. They will then have a ceremony in front of a county clerk situated on the other side of a plexiglass window in a parking lot. Only one witness is allowed, so they chose Joseph's best friend, Bennett. That way, no family member will feel left out. I can't believe it. My kid getting married in a parking lot in Orange County, it seems unreal. That's what, happened when there, that's what happens when there's a pandem pandemic. Everything's surreal. Out of the window, the morning sun starts to peek through the trees in our sleepy cul-de-sac. I wish I could be there to see them take their vows, to hug them when it's over. I change clothes and head out with my bike to distract myself. The gravel underneath the wheels of my bicycle grates against the tires and the ride becomes bumpy as I turn into the main road. Alone at this early hour and not a car or cyclist in sight, I have an overwhelming need to talk to my mother. Gone for almost two years now, she was the one who'd have some wise sage words and some humor to help me navigate this morning, this day. I speak aloud to her, mom, you there? I need to talk. I'm sure you all know about Shannon and Joe. It's so weird, mom, knowing he's getting married and we're all not there. I dodge a pothole in the road and look over my shoulder, checking to see that I'm still alone. Shannon's visa's almost up. They hired an immigration attorney to keep her from being sent back to Australia, went through all the steps, but with COVID, Shanna's job prospects came to a screeching halt and a car speeds by and then another. They've been together for three and a half years, I told Joe, just to marry her now, why wait? For what? You always told me, mom, tomorrow's not promised. I see a runner approaching and I slip my bandana over my nose and mouth. We, we wave to each other. As I was saying, mom, they have to get married before her date is up. Can you believe they're doing this a day, a random Friday in a parking lot? The road smooths out as I change the route and head home. I'm so glad you're missing this pandemic, mom. Nursing homes have been hit the hardest. It's awful. You sure dodged a bullet with that one. Still, I wish you could be part of all of this, of all the family things that have happened since you left us. Hillary's having a baby and Alan's child, Grace, will be one in a month. Today, I need you, mom. I need something from you. Please give me some sort of sign that all's okay, that we'll be okay. I'll know when I see it. It doesn't have to be big, just something to show me that you're here with me, please. Later, we gather on the street outside Joseph and Shannon's home to congratulate them. Hank catches a picture of Shannon admiring her ring, and then the couple lift their red bandanas to steal a kiss. In Shannon's lip is the bouquet I'd sent yesterday. 
adding a touch to this joyous union. They sit on the stoop and pop the champagne as we cheer them from 10 feet away. Look up there, our daughter Hillary says, pointing to the small patch of blue sky in between the trees in the canyon. A small sky riding plane has just completed the tip of a big heart etched in blue. There it is, her sign. It's big, telling me that it's all not only okay, but marvelous. I hear a voice in my head, the gravelly timber of her words. Remember, Heather, tomorrow's not promise. I raise my champagne glass, excuse me, my champagne flute to the bride and groom. Thank you, Marjorie. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. And uh, it's unusual to um, have another Hillary S. reading. And then I just heard Hillary in Heather's piece. So um, that's, that's kind of fun. Um, I teach reading and writing to adult learners. And um, the poem that I'll read is about a gift given me by one of my students um, who was Vietnamese of life. Deep gave me a warm egg, salt, pepper, and a spoon. She said, it's a different egg. When I broke it open, a watery liquid ran out. I took a small taste, then saw the pink brown mass huge in the yolk. I said to Deep, thank you. And is this the baby? There was the spine, the wings, a fertile scent. Deep said it would make me strong. Walking home later, I took deep breaths. Other snacks she's given, edamame pods, a slice of American cheese, sticky rice with sesame seeds. That protein in the shell, how did it taste? Full of flavor like flesh, like egg, like what it was. I put it in my mouth before I knew. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Kuo Jiang and I'm a lecturer in teacher education at Western Colorado University. And I have two little boys. Uh, the younger one is taking a nap now, so it's a really a precious time for me. <laughs> and uh, my poem is on page 24, Quarantine. I'm sure he has forgotten how he's quarantined peacefully in my womb for nine months. Now we are quarantined with chicken flying, dog jumping in a womb-like home waiting for rebirth. I try to teach him to play fan hua sheng, a string game, just like he toyed the umbilical cord. But soon he asked again for swings and slides, the blue mushrooms that spray water, flamingos, guo bao rou, crispy, sweet, and sour pork slices. What's wrong with all of them? Virus, invisible, but everywhere. I swallowed the second half and hatred, especially for you, an Asian face. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to read today and the opportunity to be published in Mom Egg. Um, I also appreciate that Mom Egg has so many narratives of mothering and of motherhood. My daughter turned 14 months today. Um, she's currently at the park with her dad. Um, and while I celebrate that, this, that joy, um, I also, I'm going to read a poem today that um, notes that the journey definitely was not linear. It's a contrapuntal poem. Um, and so, as you know, um, that's two or more, more poems that are in conversation with each other on the page. So I'll read each of those conversations. Taking a risk. On the day after my birthday, found out I was pregnant. The doctors were cautiously optimistic because of my levels, said congratulations, said to come back in two days. Taking a risk. The day after is when I learned or that I heard that 
no longer could I celebrate this month. Not sure, talking in hushed tones because of my age, said that they were sorry, said I could try again, but I would start bleeding, taking a risk. On the day after, the day after my birthday is when I learned or found out that I heard that I was no longer pregnant. Could I celebrate this month? The doctors were not sure, cautiously optimistic, talking in hushed tones because of my levels, because of my age, said congratulations, said they were sorry, said to come back, said I could try again, but in two days, I would start bleeding. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie and Jennifer and Cindy and Marjorie, thank you for letting me plug South Florida Poetry <laughs> Journal, SoFlo Pojo. We just launched the May 2021 issue. Um, there are five names that I recognize uh, on the itinerary of poets that have appeared in the past, and that includes uh, Cindy and Jennifer, who I've gotten to be kind of buddies with uh, in the last year or so. Um, that's another story, but that's good. Um, I purchased a copy, I haven't got it yet, so I'm gonna read it off the PDF. And um, this is the last time she sat in this chair. I close my mother's eyes. She's in bed, practicing to be a cold knickknack. Earlier, I sat her in the Queen Anne wingback, watched her stare, almost without blinking, past the glass sliding door to the lake and banyan, loaded with ragged iguanas, almost the size of her room. I watched her look out and out beyond anything I could see, cool, still, and silent as the Yadro figurine of mother and child gathering dust on the high shelf, her eyes fixed on something only those gazing at the sun see. White ibis pull their wings in the tree at lake's edge. My mother leaned, didn't seem to know anything was out there, looking, if that's what it was, past the lake and tree. To what? The past, I think, when the family gathered speaking Italian because we kids were not to hear about an aunt's divorce, rape of a half-sister in Trani. I asked my mother if she wanted back to bed she could fall leaning like that. She said, whatever you think best. Resignation, so full of sighs, I dimmed. Tucked her in and kneeling, sang a song she had sung to me once. Suddenly turning her head, her eyes widened. My mother looked at me as if to say, I remember, I remember. And her lips, almost moving, sang with me. Hi, Marjorie, and hello to everyone. It's wonderful to be with you all. The poem that I'm going to read is from Mare Vox that was published in time for Labor Day last September. God bless the child that's got his own for Labor Days poised to shatter. My friends are losing mothers and fathers. My world is losing air. Today my father died, he says to me, my friend who climbs from the sea. I say that every day, he says. Today my father died, but he keeps living and hanging. And I am remembering all the things I never wanted to hold, he says. You will let go. He will let go the branch when he is ready, I nod. Yes, he says, climbing the hill from the sea where he has gone to wash distance and salt before it comes. She is fading, she says, of her mother who is fragile as spider spun glass. She says there is a Filipina glass doll in her soul, poised to shatter, she says. And I nod, my friend who had all my babies for me when I wanted none. My friend who familyed me when I had none. 
my own mother and father long dead to leave me daughter of none and skies lone as an owl at cloud break. Fading, she repeats. My mother is fading, she repeats. Yes, I say to the girl I friended when she was gluing crystal pieces into angels to sell at a hot Saturday table to feed her babies. And we have cried together, more than shards to glue and lines to hiss or hum in the dark. She sends me her lines for her fading mother. My friends are losing their mothers and their fathers. My world is losing its compasses, we say. Fading, she repeats. My friend who gave up her poems to have her babies, to midwife so many babies into water. She who wants to give each a gentle birth to replace the night, she says too often. Now you are climbing the hill from the sea, I tell him. Now you are holding her like a child, I tell her. And now you have almost exchanged your new grandbaby for your mother, I say, to her curved spine, her long braid that has always reached her foot soles, her daughter's soul that is mourning before the death that will come when it will. An exchange, I say. You may come to see it that way, I say. Some lung is holding its breath, and he nods yes for each. It is not a swap meat sale, but a holy bargain. You who have always made angels of crystal and breath, I say to her fear. I who have always repeated, I am the woman who asks, how close is death, how near is God? Let her go today. And tomorrow I whisper, let him go and remember what you must, I tell him, I tell her, I tell myself, I tell that God who is or is not there, prepare to let this one fall home when it is ready. Fragile old angel, she will not break, only gain air. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. It's a treat to be here at the launch. Uh, thank you to Marjorie and Jennifer and Cindy and everyone at MomMeg for bringing us together on the page and here in Zoom land. The poet I'm going to uh, read for you begins with an epigraph by Jamal May from his poem, Things That Break. Will a child in a shrinking living room, sitting more still than the father. The potter. I tell myself nothing lasts. When the little girl I knew sits vaping or drinking a can of beer in her bedroom, skipping school, pretending she's an adult, no one notices or cares about. She has adults figured out how they lie, cheat, and steal to hermetically seal their impunity and solitude. How they perpetuate pure fairy tales of fairness and consequence. Inventing guilt to keep kids pressed in place like static tacks until their thumbs last breath. I tell myself there's no objective correlative when it comes to love, that things are meaningless artifacts of the past as soon as they're spit out, that only imagination lasts when consciously or unconsciously she breaks another stoneware plate her mother shaped with her own hands. Each shard I sweep, making it painfully plain, I'll never be mistaken for the one she needs. And who else can she blame when the one who would curse and laugh, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it, is no longer in it. When she's the only one who can kick the wheel and spin it. Thanks. And then this is a poem um, 
from my mother. Actually, when I was looking through my recent poems in the mom egg, I realized, oh my God, this is the story of my mother's losing sense and now being gone. Someplace to be. Shock of old photos, your parents appear unharmed by life, smooth. When my mother was young, Gertrude Stein wrote, the world goes round. I sort, sort through a box. My mother appears to sleep, flowered sheets. Once they stepped out, emerged from the jetway, someplace to go. The line of mothers with their grown children snakes past time's banquet tables. Like my mother, summer desires roses, sweeps of heat, buzzing pollinators. Hi everyone from Brooklyn. Thank you for the wonderful evening. Um, I haven't received my copy yet, but, and I'm, it's, I'm sure it's my fault, but I'm, I'm in the process of downloading the PDF. So I'm sure, long story, it's my problem. But um, I'm gonna read history, my poem history, which um, may vary slightly from the version in the, in, the, in the print issue. History. In Elsa Morante's La Storia, a drunken German soldier tries to make love to a poor mezza ebrea clandestina, secretly half Jewish single mom. Still a teen, he fumbles, falls, garbles his four Italian words, Signorina Carina Faramore rapes her. His name is Gunter. He gets killed on the next page. That's all I've read, but I suppose a blue eyed child will rise from their incontro as La Storia goes on. Thank you. Thanks so much for, I'm so glad to be here with, uh, I went to Sarah Lawrence for my undergraduate and then I went to Smith. So I feel very much in my element here today. <laughs> so I'm gonna just read the poem that I have um, in, the, in the issue of Mom Egg, which is thrillingly good. Not my poem, but the issue. Uh, Son of Circe. First, I was a piglet craving acorns and a swollen teat. Then, I was a puppy happy to cuddle, get scratched, sleep, or scurry about her feet. Variously, I became a chicken, a stag, an ass, a nightingale, an American goldfinch, a raccoon with a black burglar's mask, a kangaroo with empty pockets, a gerbil, a bunny named Cinnamon, a groundhog, nearly blind, but quick as a dart, at the first sign of trouble. As a porcupine, I was prickly and deliberate. As a swan, the lake's surface was a version of heaven. As a heron, great, blue, my erector set neck folded and unfolded like lightning in the backyard pond. As I'd snatch and gobble the frogs, I'd certainly refuse to eat as a featherless boy with more landed cravings. She practiced spells on me the way other mothers in the cul-de-sac tried new recipes or picked through ladies' home journal for Christmas crafts and ideas for seasonal decorations. Meanwhile, in our crowded kitchen, my mom rubbed dried herbs between her palms over vats of a pinch of this, a pinch of that, preparing a fresh batch, brewing another impossible me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sam Stockwell and I'm reading a poem about my mother's experiences in a nursing home. Eulogy. I take the corpse of my mother out. The ground is dry enough for her to shuffle safely across the parking lot. She squints and admires the gulls, if they are gulls. I'll cry when she finishes slurping out her rare words. 
and some other her can be summoned, as partial, as extinguished. My mother lived so long McDonald's died. The five and dime migrated to the dollar store, and the drugstore lunch counter forever closed its grave for mica stall. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mom Egg, for allowing so many of us to um, have the opportunity to read today. I'm going to read the poem that appears in this beautiful 19th issue uh, of Mom Egg Review. It's called For Black Mothers Who Can't Sleep Because the World Still Ain't Safe Enough. Um, Her son makes it home safely after a late shift, only to find her there again, twisted deep into the contour her body has carved permanently into the right corner cushion of the couch from a ritual of waiting up for him. Before the bright orange of morning can come calling on her, dusty lights from the den's TV dance over the consecrations in her face, telling details of an angst-filled and laborious life. She loses, she wars with her eyelids all night until he arrives, slides the remote control from loosely fastened fingers, turns off the TV, the lights, and then with one tender shoulder nudge, mom, I'm in. Thank you. Thank you for arranging this launch party. This has been wonderful. Uh, I'm the mother of three sons. My oldest son tragically passed away from a drug overdose in 2020. It's a different form of motherhood, learning how to carry that child in your heart when he's no longer physically with us. Uh, the poem in Mamek Review is called Poem for My Son. This is the poem in which you don't die. This is our hour to be together. The doorbell doesn't ring yet. Yesterday, I rearranged furniture, a table in front of the south facing window. In place of the peace lilies, begonias and geraniums, their stems reaching toward the light. In this poem, We've just made tacos or spaghetti. You're laughing at your own jokes, telling your brothers about the times you snuck out of the house, how you always got away with things. In this poem, I say, I love you, be safe. There are so many details to see to. To bring you back is to give you shape and smell cell by cell. There's birdsong outside the window, the bush by the door, the one I never learned the name of is budding. The earth is coming to spring. In this poem, the whole world wants to wear your face. Thank you. All right, um, I'll be reading my piece, um, Saranghae, which is on page 115. Pungent red kimchi juice oozes off the cutting board as I chop it up and toss it into the big pot on the stove. I scrape a generous spoonful of gochujang in too, along with garlic, green onions, pork, and a bit of sesame oil. The rice cooker on the counter sputters away, steam erupting from the top. I do not use a recipe when I make kimchi jjigae. My mom made it for me countless times growing up. I never cared much for following recipes anyway. Quite honestly, I just don't care much for doing fractions if I'm having or doubling a recipe. Ironically, I've always defined myself in terms of fractions, half Korean, half white. 
When I make the food my mom made for me, I wonder if there is a word for being homesick for a place you have never been. I know my mom aches for a place to belong because God knows she didn't feel she belonged with her wasp adopted mother in the Midwest. My mom was one of the thousands of Korean babies adopted to international parents in the 1970s. I can see the longing in her eyes when she watches a travel channel show about Seoul, the city where she was born and the city where she was abandoned. She has tried to connect to her roots by learning how to make different Korean dishes. I spent my childhood watching her cook. Cooking is the only way we feel connected to Korea. I have taken up cooking too to show my mom that I am also searching for a place to belong. As a military brat, I never belonged anywhere, having moved a dozen times by the age of 18. I have lived everywhere in the United States, East Coast, West Coast, the middle of nowhere in North Dakota, and the busy suburbs outside of DC. I graduated from high school in Germany, where I met my fiance, who is also half Korean. I went to college in the Netherlands and New Mexico, and yet I never truly felt at home anywhere. I learned to speak Spanish and Dutch, but never Korean. Sometimes I cook with my soon-to-be mother-in-law, a Korean immigrant whose English is not the strongest, but whose faith is made of steel. She prays with me in Korean before we eat, but I cannot understand what she is saying. Each Korean word she speaks is a lost family heirloom that my mystery of a grandmother never passed on to me. I can't help but think that in another life, we would have spoken the same language. But language is not the only way to communicate. Food is how both my mom and my mother-in-law show their love, and I have learned to do the same. Saranghae means I love you in Korean, but so does a big bowl of kimchi jjigae. Language and food are the cornerstones of culture. I cook with ingredients I cannot pronounce, but I am desperately trying to connect with a culture I never had the chance to experience firsthand. When my fiance's bowl is empty, he asks if there is more. I tell him, of course there is. I always make too much, just like my mom. He tells me he loves me, and I imagine on the other side of the world, a relative I will never know is saying sarake to her daughter. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. And uh, I keep thinking back to my first time, my first experience with Mom Egg Review in New York uh, at a reading. It was just so wonderful. There's this warm community. I am really impressed at what you what Mom Egg does in terms of bringing people together and creating a community. So um, the poem that I I will be reading is um, in the in the issue, and uh, it's from a larger piece of work called "The Transformation of Material Things." So the poem is called "A Pair of Shoes." A pair of shoes stands before me on the kitchen table. I know I must eat them. I reach for the most worn out shoe, put it in my mouth. The taste of dead days fills me, miles crumble. I make myself chew the tough tread, swallow another bite, another. I don't want to eat the shoe. But the soul is cracked, the heel broken. It has to be disposed of. It belongs to me. I finish the last of it feeling sick. The other shoe, alone on the table, mended by my mother with flour sack cotton covered in rosebuds. What good is this single shoe now, this childhood beside me? So, thank you. Um, thank you, Marjorie, um, Jennifer, and Cindy. I, I am really happy to be here with everyone and uh, want to echo the feelings about uh, what folks have said about community. I think you all do an amazing um, job of of creating a nurturing community. I really appreciate that. Um, 
and I'm really happy to have a Paul in, in this issue. And um, uh, just to quickly just say, um, you know, Mother's Day's coming, right? And uh, I have some a lot of ambivalence about this holiday. Um, my mom and I had a really uh, hard relationship and complicated and uh, by the fact that she was diagnosed with um, Parkinson's, early onset Parkinson's when I was in my teens. And um, so most of my, my sort of adolescent growing up, my mom was sick and, and, and getting, getting more ill um, all the time. So, and then when she, she actually passed away when my own kids were, you know, babies. And so we didn't have a chance to, um, I think, kind of remake that relationship the way some, some people have done um, when they have had children. So um, there's that. And then the other piece I would just say is that you just need to know for the poem um, is that I'm a Gemini, <laughs> whatever that means to you, <laughs> I'm a Gemini. And the poem is called, I Carry Myself. I carry myself like the stars I'm supposed to be made of are collapsing or I've swallowed them, constellated my very own black hole. And what's wrong with darkness? It's there we conceive where our cells do their math multiplying into you and me. I want more than I am. Is it that simple? I'm never enough, though according to the celestial maps, I'm too divided, undecided. And I want perhaps more than my fair share of sky. My mother used to say my eyes were bigger than my stomach. She was right. I saw too much. Couldn't keep it down. Does that mean we saw the same? A dark question, unanswerable, as she's long in the earth, mouth and eyes sewn shut. Sorry you had to see that. I tried, I tried to make her see, asked for nothing, hoping she'd kiss me with a mouth unfull of no, not ever. I have ideas about love. I think they're broken right here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, my glasses are a little dark because I was outside for a little bit. And uh, so I look like I have sunglasses on, but they hopefully will transition eventually. Um, thanks again to everybody, to Jennifer, to Marjorie, to Cindy for this incredible magazine and journal and ongoing support of all these fabulous writers. Um, I love lying in the bathtub every night reading one or two poems and stories. It's where I do my best soaking in of everything. Um, my poem is on page 79, if you have your journal. I work a lot in the medical world, um, teaching writing workshops to parents who have kids with chronic illness. My own daughter was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease when she was quite young. Um, she's doing pretty, pretty well now, actually. She's in her uh, 20s and in college. Um, but we spent a lot of time in uh, oncology, he hematology oncology infusion centers. So I saw a lot of kids um, with cancer and this is not a pandemic poem per se, um, but I appreciate that it was taken for this journal. It's called Lines Drawn. In their son's brain, the tumor is still growing. Both agree the hair is shaven and the slice up the skull was needed. But they argue. The woman says, it's a seam. The man says, a weld. The woman rips out threads from her sampler, repairing the motto, there's no place like harm, and says, it's stitched. The man paces, glances at the soundless TV, a home show the boy is not watching. It's stapled, not natural, he says. 
in the oncology treatment room, unlike astronomers who can't see dark matter, yet study its effects, they both see the clear patch holding his IV needle in place. They see his eyelids, sheer and veined like blinds, draping a waning window. And the boy? He is wondering if his parents like dogs, if they will adopt one from the pound or wait for a puppy. He hopes the dog will love sticks, jump for them in midair. He thinks he'd like to be that stick, thrown and returned over and over. What else will they do when he is dead? He hears his mother say, his hair will grow back. Here's his father say, I need to replaster the hole I kicked in his bedroom window. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to, to hearing everyone read. Um, I'm gonna be reading the poem that appears in the journal, Directional. This is from a new cycle that I'm working on where I weave together poems exploring um, neurodiversity. Um, I, I love several neurodiverse individuals. My, my son is on the autism spectrum and my husband suffered a traumatic brain injury and we've been caring for, uh, we cared many years for my father-in-law who has Alzheimer's. And so loving all of those people made me very, appreciative of the different ways that brains can work. And so the son, my son is featured in this poem. Directional. Among the things Hurricane Matthew gifted, palm fronds and sea onions, a hole like an open grave beneath an upturned oak. My son valued most the lizard sinking into the moldering carpet in the Florida room the scaled skin so fine and gray green was already being swallowed by the thin bones beneath. But he bowed toward death, ran his finger along its spine, circled it like an inverse compass until I thought his breath might make something quiver and point us all north again. Hi, everybody. Um, good to see you all. I just want to, I didn't even plan to say this, but Julie, who I don't know, but I was so moved by that piece. I just want to say it when she said um, the way loving people can, you know, affect your work. And it just made me, I don't know, it just made me think about the way that loving people can nourish and fortify and inform our art. And I feel like so much of what I've heard today, and certainly so much of what I sometimes you know, feel when I go to the page is, is sort of about that. So thank you, um, Julie. Uh, so thank you, Marjorie and, and Mom Egg team for, for your attention to detail and your welcoming spirit. I just, I just am so moved and impressed every time. I have the journal right here. I love the way it came out. Um, so I'm gonna read a piece called Big and Little, and it's on page 101, and it is a piece of nonfiction. Uh, I am a, primarily a nonfiction writer, but I mostly, I'm, I just find that I'm a short form nonfiction writer. So micro memoir um, and flash nonfiction is usually what appears and comes out. So this is called Big and Little. Her little girl hands, make me cry again today, but it's not just because she has a boyfriend and a hickey and a 16th birthday in 10 days. They've been making me cry for years. One morning back in 1999, I was at a red light right after I dropped her off at school. I was waiting for it to turn green and thinking about breakfast. Again, the hands. I remembered how they flipped the syrup bottle upside down and squeezed. She giggled when the thick copper liquid trickled out of the bottle cap and onto her pancake tower. Another time I cried after I pulled a splinter from her baby brother's big toe and watched those hands shake when she hand me, handed me the bottle of peroxide. I saw pink fingernails with bits of green and blue crayon wax lodged under each one. I saw soft lumpy knuckles. 
I saw a mood ring in the shape of a butterfly. So the hands tipped my heart and me over before, but thinking about them today is different now that there's a boyfriend and a hickey and an almost here 16th birthday. Thank you. So good to be here. So happy to be part of this group. Um, okay, so my piece is called Fading Memory, Fatina Fajani, who is my mother-in-law. She releases energy as if tugged by an invisible Shiroko. She sets aside her attempts to make room for binders labeled and dated to mark moments of clarity. When no one is looking, her hands run over notes on her calendar as if they were braille to pierce the fog of memory. The pads of her fingertips are animated. Soon, they will reveal what day it is, the names of those most dear. Her son intervenes in strange ways asks the same questions over and over about her past, the places she once knew. It disturbs the gray reams of her mind in a world now peopled with Giacometti stick figures instead of humans with voices and breath. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mom Egg team. This is amazing. This was, I cut short my long run today. Um, <laughs> to be here. So if I'm out of breath, that's why. Um, this poem is called Mulier Amicta Sole, um, which is another name for the um, woman of the apocalypse, which is a figure that uh, I believe appears in Revelations, but it's something that I'm, I've been playing with. And um, my now 16-year-old son appears in this poem, uh, <laughs> but he was not 16 at this time. A dog came out of the woods. Her side bled. A storm was coming. I stood on the porch of the house. My son pressed his body into mine. Wind scuttled leaves across the yard. Inside the house, something crashed. A sound like a beer can cracked. The dog howled. My son whimpered, licked his lips. Behind us, the doorknob rattled. The air smelled like cedar and salt, and the ocean turned itself over at the bottom of the cliff. Before I could speak, his father crashed through the door. My son howled like a wolf. The dog nuzzled my hand, and my son grew fur on his neck. The father tried to pull us back inside. He cried and cried. The sky blacked. He would not let go of my child. The dog whimpered, then bit my hand. The father flashed his yellow teeth. I wanted to be undone. What now? I asked the dog. The woods yawned. My son dug his fingernail, fingernails into my arm. The dog howled, run. Thank you. All right. Wow. Thank you so much. What a beautiful, what a beautiful addition and what a beautiful reading. I'm sorry I missed as much of it as I did today, but my Sunday was really packed. I'm here for the duration. Um, my mother died uh, five years ago, uh, April 23rd. And uh, in our 63 year relationship, we had some difficulties um, and then kind of came to a place of, of healing those in the last few years. And it's really quite surprising how much I see my body turning into my mother's and feel my body turning into my mother's as I age. So this poem comes from that experience. My mother's hands. In the photo, they hang oddly from red sweater cuffs, clutch one of the white paper napkins she liked to wipe her dripping nose. Caught this way, each bump and twist of knuckle and bone, the nails that grew like hooves, so hard to trim. They look like claws, except for the love in her face as she kisses the baby who meets her lips. It's a shock to see them dangling from my wrists. 
Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for hosting this. And um, a few few years ago, I learned that I have inherited the the BRCA gene mutation, which is a breast cancer gene mu mutation that greatly increases um, your risk of developing breast cancer and um, also ovarian cancer. So this is a poem called To the BRCA Gene with an epigraph from Lucy Brock Broido. I am obliged now to refrain from dying for as long as it is possible. All these years you've been lying in wait, trying to kill me. So I drive path, fast past the marsh choked with loose strife. Obliged now, I lunge into icy ocean to sting myself senseless. I stop to buy myself a double dip, soft serve at the drive-in, where the counter girl swirls a spiral to the mound's flared tip. Chocolate oozes down. I crunch that cone to crumbs. Vile gene in me that seeded my mother's pancreas, Aunt Norma's pancreas, my grandmother's breast. Where are my breastplates, my shield, and my greaves? Don't fondle me, don't beggar, don't guzzle my sunset, don't ladder my ribs, don't tribal, don't hide piper my cells over a cliff. Take my ovaries, they're nothing to me now, not my breasts, shapeshifter, and keep your goddamn devil's hands off my daughter, my granddaughter, the present continuous. Let me beat another little riff with her on her toy drum. Thank you. Yes, it's Carolina. And I'm sorry, you might hear my cat in the in the background. He's meowing to get out of the room. <laughs> Um, I appreciate being here. Thank you all for listening to me. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read the poem that was published in the Mom Egg Review. My future daughter during adolescence. My mother is crazy. She passes out copies of her favorite poetry to us every morning with toast. She says, I am just like her. We both stick our noses in our books, hoping no one important catches us like we were cold. I cannot count how many times I have opened a book and not finished it. I want to be held firmly by words, like an eyelash on my finger in the shower. I can't blow off to make a wish. But I feel like a coward, cozy, caught on boys' words. I cannot count how many times I've opened my heart and finished it. So, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here and it always feels like a family with Mom Egg. Um, I'm happy to see people I know in the audience and I'm happy to read this poem. Um, it's called The Aaron Sweater that took three years to knit and it's to my mom. I don't know how you manage this, four patterns per row, cable, trellis, trinity, and honeycomb, standing for rope, rose, deity, sweetness, and plenty, like patting head and rubbing belly and dancing backwards in heels at once. The dervishing round the needle, the practice calmed you, called to mind spinning planets, turning seasons. I tried it once and threw it down in a tangle. Did you add a, strain, a strand of your hair to tie us together? I was just 20, prone to losing important things in sorority houses. There's a holiness in warmth, quick healing from cold to be cuddled, the spread of heat like blood flowing back. May you never forget your row. May these strands tie you to me so you won't go too far away when you die. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for waiting. And um, that's my poem here. I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of Mom Egg Review. What a gorgeous journal you put together. And thank you for including this poem, which is called House Finch. 
house finch. See here the constrictor coiled. Striking hand in your other hand as if. Don't make me do that again. And what I held under the surface of my skin glowing was a long borealis, wild and electric. My daughter, the woman on the sidewalk with two black eyes, holding hands with him. My daughter at the end of the pier. If she turns to me, let the light of heaven encircle her. If her voice lands at the edge of my waking dream with its beak wide, let me hear. Thank you so much. Sorry for the scrambling. Great event. It's been, this has been such an emotional reading. I have to be honest. I just said, I mean, there are times I didn't want to cry on screen, but just, it's really been wonderful. So, um, so yes, my, Marjorie twisted my arm virtually. Um, so I'm going to read a poem. I don't know if Lenny is still here, but he published this poem in South Florida Poetry Journal a couple of years ago. Um, and I, I was looking through this manuscript that I'm getting ready to send out uh, for motherhood poems. Um, okay, so uh, the title of this poem is a line from doc, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. I don't remember as much as I would like to. I do remember the intersection, Ben's drugstore, Sons of Italy, DeSantis's aluminum siding and door store, McGee's Deli. I remember the red light, the envelope my mother handed me. No, but I figure there was an envelope because I remember the mailbox. I remember the seconds we had for me to jump out of the car, mail the letter before the light turned green. I assume she was driving the beach wagon, the country squire, or maybe the LTD. But I only know we had those cars back then. I know a letter had to be mailed. I remember a blue mailbox outside the drugstore. I remember a dog, but I don't know what kind. I'm seeing the dog from the Little Rascals, right, white with a brown circle around one eye, like a target, a bullseye. Back then, there were dogs with no leashes and they could leave their yards and dog houses at will. I don't know if this dog was female or male. Later, I learned that all dogs like to mount and hump. Even if they're fixed, they have the memory of how it feels. They can smell things that call and tempt them. I think I had on dungarees. I think my legs were covered in pants. I don't remember the heat of the dog's wet belly on my skin. I remember its front paws locked on my thigh tight, a chokehold. I remember the dog hanging on its nails. I remember someone laughed and my mother angry at me through the windshield, motioning me to hurry now, hurry, get in the car, get in the GD car. Everything else I might have imagined, but not my shame and her arms curved like thick iron hooks. Thanks. Thank you. Cindy, can I uh, hit you up? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. um, so I just searched for a motherhood related poem. And this poem was published in a journal that's now defunct uh, called the Yellow Chair Review. So I'm going to read this poem. Uh, Being your mother. When I first put her on, she fit me to a T. And looking back, I can see her reflection in the full length pushing you an umbrella stroller as you cuddled a gunned bunny. The minute you were grown, she shed me the way a snake sloughs skin. What kind of mother trick is that? Deep down in my gut of guts, I want you to know me as I am and be okay. Meanwhile, I walk behind you on a path through your new neighborhood, stopping to wonder at some flowers I can't name because I'll never be that person again. 
something tall with purple buds, purple bulbs, thistle-like studded with dormant bees. Thank you. This is called Mary Light in Texas, and it's uh, for my friend Lisa Levine. She's come over the border in full cover, in white carrying along the scent of roses and corn. She's wearing snakes around her ankles and throwing pomegranate seeds along the river. She's found her predecessor Venus and taken refuge in the full shell light of a full Texas moon. She's guarding the houses, the women, and all of the children who passed too soon. Thank you. This is my poem, Self-Portrait as Lady Macbeth in 30 Shades of Red. Cardinal, hell is murky, carnelian, I'm a frozen kiln, carmine, a honey smoke, current, mother hunger haunts, cherry, I'm a fruit, cord, coral, a pit boiled, lava, mother mist shrouds, crimson, here's the smell of the blood still, amaranth, perfume clouds, vermilion, vermin kill filial, <clears throat> Brick, second apparition, a bloody child. Garnet, is any love pitched deeper? Cerise, how tender it is. Blush, mother must murder us. Lip, I'm a seared sentence, ginger, a hot root, scarlet, sleep stalker, mahogany, unconscious mother, rose, is any loss more thorning, rufus, Reason orders old before young. Matter. Mother, then. Marooned. <clears throat> Sweeten this little hand. Burgundy. I'm an ice ossuary. Auburn. A fire bridle. Sangria, then tis time to do it. Wine, unsex me here. Cosmos, a king uncrowned. Oxblood, a sopping bed. Dark, resembled my father. Rust, passage to remorse, stopped up. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, um, Marjorie and Jennifer and Cindy. I love the art so much. It's just fabulous. Um, my poem's really short, um, but I took the name of it is called Before the Age of Reason, and I figure that's around seven years old, so it's like a memory, right? It's like a memory poem. Before the Age of Reason. The street we used to live on had wide houses. 
Then we moved to a smaller apartment above another family. Forsythia bloomed there in spring. The upper rooms were manicured. All the action was in the kitchen. It polluted my mind and suffocated me with its plastic pink appliances. Father was a lost squirrel in a beige raincoat. There was a maple tree outside and lilacs. I could hear a chainsaw buzzing in the morning on a Sunday. I was almost at the age of reason. I could feel myself slipping away. Thank you very much. And thank you to Mom Egg Review. Beautiful publication. This when I was at uh, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and um, I had been writing a, a book manuscript primarily about my mother and my daughter when a childhood friend called me and her daughter had just uh, locked herself in the bathroom because she was afraid that she was going to attempt suicide. So that's what this is about and it's a villanelle. When my childhood suicide drafts, when my childhood friend calls, I am writing the pain of my daughter. It is the same sound as her daughter's siren, now cracking the ordinary air. If her daughter recovers, mine will as well. To even utter that other life? On the phone, we can't speak what could be. Mothers mother each other, or else our already swollen fear when our child calls would write this pain too real. Daughter of my friend, your siren sounds our distance, speaks the terror I swallow each day. Friend, when is I'm here? Enough to cut despair from if. My daughter recovers, yours will as well. Let's utter lies to each other until they're true. Today's skies collapse, no words to say I love her, Enough in this weather of ordinary lives bone bare when childhood writes its pain. My friend calls. I write my daughter to remind her of sky, of the sharp turns of weather, that I love her laughter and the apple scent of her hair in October, that where if utters her well, we will recover. Daughter of mine, I can't even if the other, allowed in this autumn air, traveling fast toward other mothers who dare not stare into the evening, not knowing whether, when, a childhood friend will call. I am the pain writing my daughter into my friend's daughter, recovery ours. We utter it now for each other. Dark music. She sees him on the corner at 6.30 in the morning, every morning, on her way to the gym. From a distance, he appears older, framed by the tall sculpted hedge of a neighbor's home, thick wasted body and black mutton chop sideburns. But close up, his pale acneed skin gives away his youth. A lock of long unwashed hair falls forward and back as he nods vigorously to the music that is only in his head. Or she realizes, feeling old, he probably has earbuds hidden by all that hair. His hands are positioned to hold an invisible guitar. The bulge of his belly in a tight black t-shirt hangs over the top of his jeans. His jacket is covered in patches with symbols that repel her, skulls and pentangles sloppily stitched. A grubby satchel sits on the ground between his feet, his legs spread a little for stability, while his upper body arches and bends with abandon. It's a school bus stop, but he is always alone. No friends, no classmates. This is someone's son, she thinks. No longer the adorable chubby toddler who smiles up at his mom from the bottom of the slide. Not the apple of his parents' eyes helping with yard work or begging to hold the tools while dad fixes a leaky faucet. She pictures her own blonde, slim son, his athletic body tensed and spring-like, taking the stairs two at a time. 
A shock of glossy straight hair hangs over his forehead too, and he flicks it back with that familiar sideways shake. Her son in a crowd at the bus stop, mouth agape in laughter, teeth so white and even. Other boys leaning in close for the joke, pretty girls hovering nearby. They look like a soap commercial, so clean and wholesome. Not this boy and his dirty denim jacket that won't button, his unsmiling face, eyes closed, lost in dark music. He does not look wholesome or appealing. He is someone's son, she thinks, and they are disappointed and disapproving. They wish he'd clean himself up, shave for God's sake, find a girlfriend, join a sports team. She would feel that way too. If this boy were her son, she would be critical and impatient and affronted. She would be embarrassed to take him to church or to her husband's company picnic. A sullen boy who sits alone with his book of anime instead of playing frisbee with the others. But her own son, the joiner, playful and freckled and gleaming, had smiled his last shuddered smile at her from the white satin frame of his coffin after his overdose. This boy is here every day at the bus stop, every day, and she just hates him, hates every little thing about him. And still every single day, it's all she can do not to pull over at the crosswalk and get out and wrap her arms around his warm, solid girth. <laughs>